Hello and welcome, welcome. <laughs> my name is Alex Cooper. And if you haven't been in one of my classes before, and also Happy New Year. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> happy New Year, Happy New Year. So if you haven't been in one of my classes before, let me introduce myself. My name is Alex Cooper. I teach the computer classes for the Columbia County Library in Evans, Georgia, the Harlem Library, and also our new Grovetown Library. Yay! So we're, of course, staying safe and everything, and we still wanted to bring classes to you. So, of course, we're doing all our classes virtually. So please share our classes with friends and family members, especially if it's like on YouTube or something. And also, we're going to be doing classes this month on Facebook as well. So definitely feel free to share those. And if you're watching this, um, you know, after I've recorded as well, just know that if you do come to a live class, you can also ask questions, and I'm happy to answer those in the chat and everything. So as folks come into the class, I'll go ahead and say, welcome to class. <laughs> welcome to class. And also, let's go ahead and start off with, does anybody have any questions? Okay. And I'll tell you a little bit about our other classes that we have coming up for the month. And the big question I always want to ask is, how can I help? Okay. What questions do you have? How can I help? Let's first start talking about uh, what classes we have for this month, and I'll disappear for a second. But you should still be able to hear the sound of my voice. So this month we're doing our photography classes on our Columbia County Library. For our Columbia County Library, we're doing photography fundamentals and cloud backup, and also advanced photo editing and layers, which is a lot of fun too. So we're doing all those three on YouTube. Tomorrow morning, come join me. We're going to start our new series. We're actually doing uh, a thing where we're actually going to be breaking up our cord cutting into two parts. So uh, the cord cutting has gotten a lot bigger, a lot more things going on. So we've actually split that up into two classes now, and we're going to be doing both of those classes twice uh, this month. So make sure that you catch up on that. Believe it or not, if, uh, about two years ago, we actually had it so that we had uh, 75 people signed up on uh, ground for our uh, cord cutting class. And we had to cut off the class at 50, and then we had to have a second class in February for 25. So a lot of people asking questions about that. So definitely come join me for tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We'll be talking about antennas. And then next week on the Harlem uh, Facebook page, we'll be doing the cord cutting, the streaming services. And then we're going to be repeating that again on the, 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 the Columbia County Library uh, Facebook page as well on the 20th and the 21st. Okay. We're also going to be doing, let's talk about Libby. So maybe you got some new devices this month. As you see, we have gadget help kind of sprinkled in there as well. Uh, so we're doing gadget help for all three libraries this month on the fa their Facebook pages, so come join me for that. If I don't get a lot of questions, still come out for that because I'll be talking about lots of free stuff that's from the library that you can access as well. And of course, we have our own Libby class there, so if you got a new device, a Kindle or something, a new phone, come by. We'll talk about getting free eBooks and a whole bunch of other stuff too, okay? So come join me for that, and also we're gonna finish up the month with a chess class and we're going to be doing an instant pot class on the 28th. Okay, so come join me for that. And we're going to be to finish it up the whole month on the, uh, excuse me, on the 28th, we're in the morning, we're going to be doing an instant pot class. And I'll be actually doing that for my kitchen to show off. It's a class I've taught before, but I've got some new tricks we're going to talk about too. And then in the afternoon, I actually got a uh, air fryer for Christmas. So we're going to learn about our air fryer and different kind of neat things we're going to do about that. So definitely look forward to that and please share those as well. So that's what we'll be doing for January and come join me for those classes. Little side note here, Libby is our new library uh, resource to get free audiobooks and eBooks. I've been listening recently to a short story book, which is all read by different, um, I guess you say vocalists, vocalist actors, I don't know. But it's been really neat, so each little short story has a different uh, voice reading it. Very easy to do. Install the Libby app. All you really need is your credit, your, um, your, uh, excuse me, <laughs> your library card. All you need is your library card. Uh, sign in uh, to the app. Just set up the, just choose Greater Clarks Hill Regional Library System. Choose Georgia Download Destinations. Enter your library card and you'll be good to go. 
Our libraries are open with limited services and hours. You can go to our website, gchrl.org, for details on that. Also, curbside holds pickup is still available. You can call in the library questions Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates and everything. And if you're searching for our YouTube channel, just search GCHRL videos and it will pop right up. All right, whoop, went too far. Hang on, let's go back here. Don't want to go back, <laughs> don't want to go back too far there. All right, so let's go ahead and I actually will plan on posting this in the chat as well. So let's go ahead and get our hand up, popped up. So any questions before we get started? So it's actually one, uh, it's kind of a two part handout. And let me see if I can get that posted in the chat real quick. Okay, so this is the Okay, it's loading. Still loading. All right, so let me post this into the chat. You can click right there and download it. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get started. Okay, and of course I'll disappear if I'm, you know, in the way or anything. Let me zoom in here so I can make it larger. I know everybody's not on a big computer screen or anything, but there's different ways that you can play YouTube or Facebook on a big TV if you want to, with like a little device or a tablet as well. So let's go ahead, we're gonna talk about our photography basics, okay? So we're gonna do a quick little overview here. Our new digital uh, cameras versus, of course, our film cameras and stuff. The big course thing is that we can do an instant review of our pictures as well. We only, only need to print what we want, and we'll talk about that in our print class. I believe we have that on the schedule as well. Uh, more pictures taken, uh, no cost per photo. So the big thing here is at least take two pictures. So in any situation, really recommend, you know, if you're going to take one picture, take two. And then one picture may look better than the other, okay? All right, let's talk about what we'll need, well, things that we need to know. One thing exactly, what is a megapixel? So a lot of things about this, if you're buying a new camera, even a new, like a new smartphone or something, someone will say, what exactly is a megapixel? Well, we don't really need to know exactly what a megapixel is. Basically, you just kind of know that it's a pixels. Pixels are the little squares, okay? So here's our pixels right here. So if we take a digital picture and we zoom in, zoom in, zoom in on it, we'll actually see, start to see like the little squares on there, okay? And that's our pixels. So if we have something that doesn't have as many pixels um, in it, we try to print it or make it bigger, one of the things that will happen is it'll start to look kind of blurry. So we do want to make sure that we have a camera that when we take pictures, we can make it big enough if that's what your goal is or if you're just gonna print a five by six or a four by six or something, um, or you were trying to crop in or something if you're gonna print that, do you realize that you need to make sure that um, you have enough pixels on there. One thing a lot of folks don't know, except for the, like, the newer iPhones, uh, most of our cell phone uh, cameras, actually you do the pinch and zoom, you're actually doing an auto crop, you're not actually zooming in on anything. And the new iPhone only does like a, a two zoom um, in, in like a fish eye. Uh, kind of situation. But I do realize if you're trying to print it bigger, here's kind of a little bit of mock up here. So if we actually were looking here, and you'll see this on the box and stuff. So basically, if something says, you know, eight megapixels, it actually means million pixels by using this and doing this mathematical equation that's listed right here. Okay. Let's see. Can you see? So you can see the arrow. Okay. Anyway, so we're looking at our three uh, uh, 32, uh, 1,000, 24, 
uh, um, excuse me, uh, 3,266 by 2,450. Do the mathematical equation, and then you'll get 8 million pixels, and that's why they come up with the megapixel, okay? It's a lot easier to say that than to explain that on the box. So if you look here, and you're trying to kind of guess and see how big you can make something, you can see here is kind of our print size, talking about that. Now in printing, we'll get to talk about that a little bit more, so come join me for that class as well. Has a little bit more information there. And if I think I can zoom in a little more here, that shouldn't be a problem. There we go. All right, so let's scroll down a little more. And let's talk about our point and zoom cameras. And I will disappear, though I'm not blocking um, anybody's view or anything. Okay, so let's talk about our point and zoom cameras. Okay, we have a point and zoom. Uh, usually they're mirrorless because we'll talk about the digital SLR cameras in just a second and those do have a mirror in there is what they kind of reference them. So you're basically looking at a computer screen. It does have the zoom in, zoom out, different sizes. I will sell, tell you this, one of the, the, the negative things about kind of the smaller cameras now is the software on there on our cell phones is getting so much more advanced and even with the newer version of the cell phone, you could do so much more, even if it doesn't have a, a more of a zoom on it. And the newer iPhones actually do have, uh, the, the higher model ones actually do have a little bit of a, a zoom on, on built in, okay? So we actually have that, it's very compact. We also have our cell phone, which is really becoming our major uh, camera, you know, kind of using it as a point and shoot. But again, we don't really have a big zoom like we do on this camera here over here. So this is kind of a mid-range camera. This is one of the cameras that I have. And it also has the thing where it has the pop-up flash on it. So it has a really nice flash. But a lot of the software with our cell phones, you can download additional software. Things like this app, it's called Night Capture. Really like that one. And it makes the pictures on low light or if you're trying to do some kind of landscape come out really well. So some of the drawbacks with the, with the um, cell phone cameras and some of them even have things like portrait mode or even self flash things to try to really work on the software to make it uh, more designed but eventually we probably will get basically a cell phone or eye camera or something like that that does have a big lens on it okay so def definitely look for that in the future so the software is one of the big things with this, but you still may want a really huge zoom. We're talking about 30. Uh, this picture here, I think, says 42x zoom in there. So we still need to learn a little bit of our camera, and that's one of the things we'll be talking about today as well. So with our digital SLR, DSLR uh, camera, uh, one of this is kind of the, the more of, people would say a real camera, which isn't very nice, but that's just what a lot of them do. So professional grade cameras, one big thing that you can tell is the mid-range ones. How can you tell the difference? Well, uh, you are looking through a computer screen when you look through the little peepholes and stuff, and the lens does not come off. If the lens comes off, it means that it's a digital SLR, okay? It's a bigger sensor on there than what a cell phone camera usually has or what a uh, mid-range camera has or a compact camera. But like I said, you don't have the software like you do on like the cell phone cameras or Apple devices and stuff. The big thing about these are is it actually uses a mirror. So when you look through uh, the viewfinder here or the peephole, you can actually see that it actually reflects. And one of the things it does is the mechanical when you press the button and it takes the picture and it actually will close and it does like a like a, a blink. And I heard a photographer once talk and he said that when he was trying to film some kind of sporting uh, sporting someone trying to catch the ball or something if he saw the person catch the ball that means he missed taking the picture but if he didn't see the person catch the ball right when his he pressed the the, um, uh, the button to take the picture then he knew he got the picture okay so that's one of the things to think about right there higher end camera here you know, you're talking about low grade, a lot of places like Sam's, Costco and stuff will sell, um, you know, I won't say lower end models, but models, you know, about $500, $600 range, it depends. Um, kind of more of an entry level is the, I guess, a nicer way to say that than the really, really expensive ones. So this is what the professionals photographers use. 
let's talk about our zoom. We've talked about it a little bit. Mostly our cell phone cameras and, and other ones have our fixed focus, okay? Like I said, there's some new cameras that do have like a two zoom on there, but still the little compact ones can go up to, you know, five or even seen with eight zoom actually sticking out. And then our mid-range and of course our digital SLRs do the big zoom as well, okay? So we have what's known as optical zoom or kind of real zoom, kind of like pulling out a telescope and doing zooming in on the stars or something or a faraway place. There you go right there with your telescopic lens and then you don't lose anything when you're trying to print something. Digital zoom, like I said, can be like a pinch and zoom, so be aware of that. I've even had family say someone spend the time to do like a pinch and zoom on their cell phone and the person goes, don't do that, just make sure you get the picture and we'll crop the picture later, which is basically what that is, okay? If you're just gonna share pictures with your friends and family, maybe not get them blown up to eight by 10 or something. And interesting is if you do have a lot of you know, just normal pictures you take in with your cell phone and stuff. You really don't want it to be big, really big. Maybe a collage might be a good idea, and we talk about that in the printing class. So you can get a whole bunch of stuff, maybe at a uh, eight by ten or something, make it uh, like a collage. So that's kind of fun. All right. So digital zoom, uh, we just talked about that. Also, thirty-five millimeter has all kinds of different um, lenses to change in and out. Um, just a little side note, some of the older ca uh, cameras, if someone has maybe the same model, uh, um, Nokia, or, I mean Nokia, um, a Nikon or something, Nokia, <laughs> Nikon, Canon camera in an attic somewhere, it might be possible that it could fix, fix the new um, lenses. You just have to see about that. So any questions about that? So that's mainly our three types of cameras that we have. Um, but of course, you could always take pictures using this, using your Zoom, trying to take tr uh, work on that and then work it um, better on the software later, okay? Let's talk about our memory cards too. So our cameras do need memory cards. Maybe you do have a, a, um, an Android th phone that does memory cards as well. There's a lot of people getting into doing vlogs and stuff. And of course, they may start out and I actually do, we do a YouTube class and I do kind of recommend just pull your camera out and start filming, talk, learn some, a little bit of basic editing. We cover that in a whole bunch of our different classes. Uh, do a little bit of basic, learn how to do a little bit of basic editing stuff. And then one of the things is, um, then you can move on and try to say, well, I need this camera, I need this equipment, need this, kind of learn how you, what you're going to work on and stuff, okay? So one of the things is if you are going to get into videos, uh, a lot of the folks, they want to get a higher end at digital SLR to film uh, videos, maybe even get into um, using a GoPro or something. But if we look at these right here, we can actually talk about our different kinds. Now, thank goodness most of our cameras have switched over to uh, SD cards. Okay, so we have these. Uh, which is our SD cards here. There's not really any weird formats going on anymore, thank goodness, because a while back we had a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, the big thing to note about this is, and I'll tell you because a lot of people go, which one should I buy? Okay, well, I would recommend the speed, whatever your camera supports, that's what you get. You can pull, pull out an SD cam, um, memory card that you've had for a long time, put it in pretty much any camera, even if it's a very high-end one, it'll use that memory card to save to, but it may be slower, it may not be able to save video to it properly, it could make your video choppy. So how do I know what to do? Look at the manual. So you look at the manual and they've tried to come up with this whole class system where they have the different numbers on here uh, and it talks up here about 4K uh, video and stuff and eventually we'll be talking about 8K video because that's going to come down the turnpike and everything. Um, so, talking about the different class on there, you can look at the memory cards, it'll have like a circle 10 on there to let you know what the speed is and stuff. Mainly look at your camera, what does it support, what does it recommend, that's really what I would do. And then the other thing is, basically the, vi the biggest memory card you can afford, okay? A lot of people do like maybe 64 gig, um, maybe 128 gig uh, memory cards, having two of those so you can switch them in and out. And if you go on vacation somewhere, you can always, um, you know, just pop them in and out. Uh, 
you know, and then we actually have in our next class, so we'll be talking about tomorrow, we'll be talking about uploading our pictures to the Google Cloud and stuff and exactly how that works and getting around that. So if you were going to go on a vacation, you're not near your computer, you're trying to unload pictures you've taken and videos so that you can get more, there you go right there. If you have a normal camera, you can actually pull out the this and, and pop it in and out like that and maybe just get you a new memory card when it gets full. There you go right there. These are becoming less and less in cost, so it's not as big a deal. What's the difference between the small little micro ones? There isn't any. Um, they're just designed a little more. They may cost a little more than kind of a normal size. If you do get the smaller ones, it does give you a little bit more versatility. Do you realize these are super easy to lose? And if your computer or your, your camera doesn't support, if you've got a micro um, SD card in your camera or your computer doesn't support, you can always get like a caddy and put it in there. And they've got little adapters to plug it into the USB as well. So if your computer doesn't have a SD card port, micro SD card port or something like that, you can always get an adapter that will plug into the USB or USB-C and then you can access it that way. Okay. Let's talk about uh, JP uh, format 2, uh, JPEG. Uh, so basically this is what your most your cameras when you take a picture and tomorrow we'll talk about organizing our pictures too. When we take a picture it's this really big thing and you know you may have heard the term raw a lot of folks don't use that. I don't really recommend using that because you really won't get that much pictures or videos. Sure, it's not compressed at all, um, but for most of us, just you won't really need to worry about that at all. So your camera takes a picture, it put, saves it to the memory card, it may give it image and give it a number, photo give it a number. So when we talk about, yes, tomorrow, excuse me, tomorrow when we talk about organizing our photos, one of the things is just realize our memory cards, it just has a whole bunch of numbers on there. Um, and that's where, why we have to really focus on trying to use organization software to try to organize them. Okay. All right. So there are other formats uh, too, but that's really our main ones that our cameras use. Uh, red eye uh, reduction. Okay. How to get around that. Now, there is certain software that you can use. Um, the iPhone has a really nice built in software to try to fix red eye. Uh, so what exactly is red eye? Red eye is when the pupil of the eye is open, okay, and it kind of flashes, and it flashes, and it bounces off the inside of the cornea, and then you get a big red um, glowing orb or whatever in someone's eye instead of it being, you know, their, their pretty brown, pretty blue eyes or something like that. How did this normally happen? Well, this normally happens, let's say that you're having a pool party and it's kind of starting to get close to the evening, you know, turning kind of dusk. You get everybody and say, okay, everybody get together. We're going to take like a group picture. And then you take a picture and I've had family members where it's like one person. I pretty much know they're going to give me a bad red eye. The big thing is if you're going to take a group picture, always take more than two pictures. Okay. So I know I said earlier two. But if it's a group picture, try to take as many as you, you know, feel comfortable, you know, just so that if someone's looking away, look in this certain directions, you won't, um, you know, you, you, you'll, you won't get the person that still wants to talk. You know, you've gotten everybody together. They're only going to stand there like a second. And then they're like, eh, you got it. So try to take that opportunity. So the red eye thing, so imagine we're at a pool party and there's floodlights outside. It's turning kind of dusk. Put your, position yourself so the light is behind you. So I'd get position myself so the flat, the floodlight was behind me. The floodlight is shining on them. That's a big one right there. Now another thing is you can turn on the red eye reduction um, on the camera. Okay. The only problem is that you do need to tell your group that it's going to double flash or something like that because a lot of the times they may see the first flash and then they turn to their friend and they start talking. Another one is if it's a younger group, maybe even tell them, okay, two serious photos and then we'll do a silly one. So then they'll actually know, okay, I'm going to do something silly, you know, rabbit ears or just, you know, something funny. And um, they'll know to do that in a minute, not on your first picture. You're trying to get a serious one. You would believe it, but once you tell them that they can be silly in a picture, a lot of the times they're like, well, I don't want to do it then. <laughs> and then they're serious and you get a, a good serious photo. Okay, so... 
the red eye and like I said you can clean it up in post tomorrow we'll talk about some software and then on Thursday we'll talk about some major software that you can go in there and edit red eye I personally had pictures uh, taken of myself got red eye so bad that it, the red eye actually went outside my pupil and if you try to use some of that software it just turns it gray so it still looks very very weird so do realize that if you can fix the the red eye in real life maybe even have someone stand behind you with their cell phone light on whatever you got to do stop that red eye okay because you can fix it later but it may not be perfect or may not look normal okay so let's talk about how to use our camera shutter okay so now we're kind of focusing on um, you know our manual cameras and then we're of course going to talk about our cell phone cameras more of our digital stuff we'll talk about a little bit talk about our exposure so we're kind of trying to cover the gambit here things I've learned through the years and of course things I, I would recommend to people and someone says well why is it doing this as well this is things that you could do to try to stop that well a big thing is to try to get your camera ready okay so you're in there and you're going okay well what exactly should I do well you need to get your camera ready okay now what does that mean do you have a camera bag and I recommend a camera bag I don't have my camera right with me or I'd show you a nice camera bag one that's maybe waterproof um, I think it's low pro is, is a good company right there they're very inexpensive um, but the good thing about it is if you're out and about and it starts to rain you can just stick your camera in there and if it gets a light sprinkle it won't bother anything and it'll work so that'll protect you so getting your camera ready thinking about having to take it out of the bag pull your camera out does it have a lens cap you have to take off uh, or if you're going to do a flash do you have to f pull the flash up do you, you got to press the button to have it on and it is recommended to it maybe if you don't want to have it around your neck to have one loop on your hand um, the the um, so you don't drop it and break your camera okay that's a good one too so imagine we are at Animal Kingdom we're on safari and we're riding the uh, safari ride and we're looking out the animals we want to try to get a good picture of the animals well you see a giraffe out there you pull your bag you see the giraffe goes okay it's going to probably take me about 10 seconds which doesn't sound long but 10 seconds to get my camera out get my open my bag get the camera you know open the bag get the camera out turn the camera on have it around my hand so it don't drop it um, I my previous camera anytime I turn the camera on it automatically pop the uh, the lens off and and if I wanted if it wanted to take a flash it would automatically pop up the the flash well my newer camera um, which I've had for a few years now didn't do that and it actually took me a long time to learn uh, my new camera so one big thing is and I've actually had people come to class and they go well, I'm gonna take a really big trip and I just got this camera and I go great you need to go in the backyard and play around with it for about a week and they go why and I go well you will learn your camera I said just go in the backyard you know every day you know I try to go up that backyard just take a few pictures of maybe a squirrel maybe some plant you can delete it later just recharge your battery I said just that little bit of time you using the camera you will become an expert on that camera so when you're on a trip and some you know the situation pops up and you have the option and you have the ability you know to take a really great picture you know maybe you're in Egypt or something and you've got to, trying to get a picture of uh, someone on a camel walking by the pyramid in the background and if you knew your camera you would know when to get ready have your camera ready turn on all that kind of good stuff and then of course knowing how to use your shutter which we're about to talk about too so anytime you're going to do anything like that get a new camera play around with it a little bit um, you know before you do anything too now I've actually had a uh, personal I guess I'd say tragedy that happened I was invited to a surprise birthday party and I had a new camera well my old camera I all I did was I turned the the knob to where it said video and press the normal photography shutter button and it would start well the new camera I had not really realized but the new camera to start recording a video I actually had to press a record button 
So when the, everybody yelled, yelled surprise, I thought I was recording a video. And of course I had told everybody, oh, I got a new camera. This is gonna be great uh, for this party. And believe it or not, I did not get a video of the person being surprised because I had not learned my camera. So shame on me. So learn from my mistakes and uh, try to learn your camera before using it for something important, okay? All right, so a big one, of course, is our battery level. Uh, big recommendations to at least have maybe two if you're going to go, two batteries if you're going to go on a trip, okay? Let's say you're going to go on a cruise. One good thing is you could have one battery get back in the room charging, and you could just switch it out, switch a memory card out, and then keep taking pictures, okay? And you know you will get in situations where uh, you need to take for your you're going to use you're going to use your cell phone for taking pictures and video. You need to take an extra battery for your cell phone, okay? Especially if you're on a trip somewhere or just going to be like, okay, well I'm going to take a day trip somewhere. Take it. it's very inexpensive, you know, less than ten dollars if you want to get a really big one, uh, twenty maybe thirty dollars for a really big one that would charge a few cell phones together. And if you want to be a family hero charge one of those pretty much anytime you get around like teenagers or other family members that are very heavy into charging their phone and then they'll be like oh no my fed by my cell phone's dying you go, i got a charger for it and they're like yeah you're the best so be be the charge hero of the family and also if you're going to use your camera to film videos or use it a lot don't want you to get out there and all of a sudden you used it, you used up your battery taking pictures and videos, and now your phone is dead. So for safety, it's a good idea to have an extra battery um, for your devices. Or, you know, take pictures with your camera and your camera battery dies, you go, oh no. Well, at least I got my cell phone, now it's a backup, okay? So before we do the shutter, and a big thing about this is for cell phones, cell phones do have shutter lag as well. And what I mean by that is, is when we hit the button, okay, we usually hit the button slightly to focus, okay, and our cell phone, so we tap it, and then it may not take that picture immediately, it may do like an autofocus and then take a picture. So that's kind of like a shutter lag. This will let you know when your camera actually takes the picture. Now, with, um, with a digital SLR, it's automatic. And instantaneous when you press that button it, it takes that picture it's like a mechanical thing okay so that's why someone that's a professional photographer may want that the shutter lag is a lot less okay press the button you're taking the picture and it's done okay there's even an old commercial that they had a celebrity walking through a restaurant and there's three ladies having a, a brunch or something and it talked about them all pulling out the camera at the same time. They pressed the button at the same time, but only one of them got it. And at that time, that camera company was pushing that their compact camera uh, had a, a less of a shutter lag than the rest of them, uh, which, which was great. And I really wish they kind of published that more. And that was like one of the goals is our camera takes faster pictures or our cell phone takes faster pictures. But it's not really the goal because picture, you know, people kind of focus more about uh, you know, I guess not being as fast, but taking maybe a qual more quality picture, I guess, is what they would say. But anyway, so you're pulling it out, you're looking at the drafts, you pull your camera out, and you go, okay, so it's going to take me 10 seconds, pull my camera out like that, turn it on, take the um, pop the, 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 um, uh, the lid, <laughs> pop the lid on it. Uh, I'll think about it in a second. Anyway. Uh, and I'm pressing down on the button, it's focusing, and I'm pressing, pressing hard on it, and then boom, it actually takes a picture, okay? So that can be up to 10, 12 seconds. You just have to kind of get used to your what you do, okay? Or have your camera out and be ready all the time. One other thing that you can do is you can depress. Oh, I know it's sad, but that just means press the button halfway, okay? You can press it halfway, let it focus on the image or whoever you're looking at, and then you can move your camera around for some of the other stuff we're going to talk about in a minute when we talk about composition, okay? So let's say you're at the Grand Canyon. You're trying to take a picture of a couple standing there. Got your camera. You don't want them in the middle. You want to put them off to the side, which we'll talk about our rule of thirds in just a minute. Press down, hold a little bit. It autofocuses it on them. And if this was your cell, if your cell phone, you would tap on them, do autofocus, and then 
um, you'd have the camera where you want it to be and then take the picture okay so that's one thing that you can do with that set up the autofocus move around and then press the button and it'll, you've gotten the picture there and we just talked about shutter lag a little bit the time between you pressing the button and it actually taking the picture so if I said that was a minute uh, excuse me a second and a half you do realize if you're trying to take a picture of kids running around you know and then you're like okay well, we'll We'll press the button, press the button, take the picture. Oh no, they're out of frame already because they're running around. Uh, do realize you learn your camera, then you'll know kind of a little bit more. Okay, let me press here so when they get in there, I can get a good picture of their face. Okay. All right, so this is kind of a uh, take with you. It has all the um, kind of common things that are listed in a camera. Okay, and you'll still see these. Um, icons like on a digital camera or on also on a cell phone as well so I'm just going to briefly go over these this usually means like a flower or you'll see a pictures a person's face is our portrait mode here's your close-up mode one big thing about our, our digital cameras or cell phone cameras you can tap and it'll try to do some kind of autofocus tap on your subject here's a big one here here's your timer I know people think selfie sticks are very silly, but to trust me, you can get you a cheap selfie stick. Sometimes the dollar store sells them. And um, if you don't have an external clicker, you can set the timer, tap it, then hold it up, set it for five to 10, set three, five, and 10 is what they allow you to do most of the time. Three, five, and 10 seconds, get everybody together, and then you can get a good group picture. I know of someone that um, her and her husband always takes around a monopod, which we'll talk about tripods in a second. And the monopod also allows them to take really good selfies too. So they have something to be really stable for pictures and they can use for selfies and it kind of collapses up to be really small as well. So again, if you're traveling with someone and you want to be in the pictures, you know, I don't say again because I haven't said this yet, <laughs> but it's something I say a lot. So if you do want to be in the pictures, try to set this up. Try now we'll talk a little bit later about the little the little small tripods so you can actually get in some pictures too. Um, so don't be that person that um, you come home, you show a bunch of pictures and you're in none of them because you were too busy trying to focus on taking pictures of the people. And also you're at a restaurant, you're out and about, have someone, you know, works there, whatever. A lot of the times they may offer, but just say, hey, would you take a group picture of us? And usually they're very happy to do it. And, you know, boom, you'll have a group picture of everybody. Here's our play button on here to play back our pictures or our videos on there. Of course, look for the menu. Sometimes the menu's um, in the middle of the camera or the OK button. Uh, this, of course, is our delete button on here to make sure that when you're previewing a vid uh, reviewing a video or picture, there's your delete your trash can. There's kind of our universal symbol for our uh, USB ports. Okay, plug USB into there. And here's our universal symbol for turning the camera on and off. Okay, our power button. It's on your cell phone, it's on your um, laptop, it's on there somewhere. There's your on and off button. How do I turn it on? Look for the circle with the line. And then there's our portrait mode right there, trying to kind of set it up landscape mode portrait some cameras actually have scenes on there you can put it into scene mode okay sometimes our, our cell phones may have that mode as well or it may guess what's going on how close are you you know to something here's a landscape mode and of course our action mode or something like a night mode and here's our video camera so if you're trying to learn with your your normal camera it may have an extra button on there to record video okay here's a big one right here here's our flash so here's our auto flash it looks like lightning going down on auto here's just our flash is always on and this is our no flash so this is very important right here why is that so important well if you're about to take a picture and it's at night if you have it on auto it's probably going to flash now do you want it to flash or do you do not want it to flash you may think there's enough light I will tell you this, a lot of museums, um, you know, events, I'll say events, uh, they may not actually mind you taking pictures or even a video, but they may not want you to see any kind of flash, especially museum. You'll see these signs says no flash photography. And a lot of times people go, oh, well, that means I can't take pictures. 
Sure you can, they just don't want you to flash. Uh, so make sure that it has the flash turned off. Um, and a lot of the things that we can do as well is if a lot of the times you can put your cell phone in um, the silent mode or the vibrate mode and then take pictures and no one will hear anything. So let's say you're trying to get some candids, let's say like at a birthday party or I don't know, wedding reception or something. And the problem is once people, a lot of people will hear the click, they look at you and they go, oh, don't take my picture. And then they start covering their face or now, and it was like, I was trying to get a picture of like um, uh, someone drawing or something and now I've interrupted them. And it's like, I just want to get a picture of you drawing or looking at something or you, you guys were talking to each other and y'all looked happy. And now y'all know that I've taken your picture. And you know now you're like, eh, you don't take my picture. Um, so that's the way people will be, and it's happened forever. Anytime anybody's family members had like a camera, then they're like, don't take my picture. And so later on in life, you look at all these videos, and you're like, <laughs> you're like, why do they act that way? You know, now that it's uh, you know many years down the road, it's like, well, if I had turned the flash off or turned the sound off, maybe I would have gotten more of a candid, and then gotten like a nice smile. Hey, you taking my video? Yeah. Um, kind of thing so that's a big thing to do to remember to turn the flash off so here we are with our red eye reduction as well um, like I said you can do that it'll do like a double flash but definitely tell um, your people that you're doing that okay or they'll kind of start looking away and there's our battery uh, power as well now we're gonna go into this so I'm actually gonna come back to this this is gonna be talking about our aperture our shutter speed and also putting something in manual as well so let's go ahead and we're going to go over to our other part, which is our photography basics. And it's going to show our megapixel and our zoom a little bit. And then it's going to go into our other parts as well. Okay. All right. So this is kind of like our, I don't know, our second part, more of our presentation. In class, what I usually would do is I'd actually have um, this on the screen. And then what we just talked about is kind of like a handout and then I could show this so that they could take that with them okay so again here's our make our pixels so we have our deer here so a big one is to make sure that you're not digitally zooming in maybe on your cell phone or something so if you do want to print something out you will be able to here's talking about our zoom here's a big example of a normal optical zoom you may have a fuzziness but if you're using digital zoom, then you get this blurriness that can't really come back. Not real zoom, it's kind of like you're cropping something, okay? Again, and you'll hear me say this in just a second, um, maybe get closer to your subject. That's really the best thing to do, move closer. All right, so we're gonna talk about bad photos, the blurry blues, okay? How can I stop? bad photos how can I stop the blurry blues okay 50% of all our failed photos are due to blur okay um, you know I don't know what to say about that but it's due to blur usually okay uh, you have to be careful blur is not always obvious at first and again take two pictures uh, blurriness can be caused by unsteady camera so let's say this person was moving either the camera or they were moving the guitar. Make sure the thing stays still and then you stay perfectly still as well. Is it low light? The light cannot be captured by the camera as quickly as it would be during the day. Um, is there fast movement going on? Have you zoomed into something from far away so maybe the camera is a little bit more shaky? Okay. Uh, is it failing? Is it, is it falling out of focus? Okay, so you're trying to focus on a subject and the camera is only focusing on the background. It's possible. What about the slow shutter speed? So here's supposed to be a picture of, let's say, New York City or a skylight somewhere. Okay, and there we go right there, trying to drive by. If you're trying to drive by, let's say, in a taxi or something or an Uber, take pictures of buildings at night it may it probably will not work out unless you're at a, a stop and you're very still maybe it'll work out then but just remember any kind of you moving or your subject moving will cause blur all right so let's talk about our blur solutions now someone out there is going oh no 
Now he's going to talk about putting something on a, a tripod. Ugh, that's the worst. I got to carry a tripod around with me. Well, there's a lot of different options, okay? And we'll talk about some little small ones too. So things that you can do, okay? You can use a traditional tripod, okay? It's a great idea. It depends on what you're going to take pictures of. Um, it's, it, it reduces blur, our blue blur solution, like I said. We talked about there's even ones that are like tripod, monopods. So even the fact of having this one, just put this on the ground, will be more um, less likely of you having you know movement just because it's just one on the ground mono instead of the tri or the three uh, feet on the ground and it also ones like this you can see it actually stretches out and you can turn it into a selfie uh, camera as well and you can get extra little things that allow you to click uh, the camera so instead of you pushing on the camera um, creating motion and that's creating blur um, there you go right there you've got a picture even even a tripod let's say a picture at night that you're gonna someone's gonna take it's still better to be on a tripod than maybe even someone holding it okay so again we're still fighting with how to get rid of bad photos blur is your number one um, bad guy right there so you could put it on a self timer okay so you tell it 10 seconds wrap it to something put it up there and then guess what with the tripod even a small little one like this or one like this there you go you can set it up maybe at a restaurant you're eating with family set this on another table click the 10 seconds tell everybody you know hey I'm gonna take a picture run over there and then look you're in the picture too okay helps with blur you can take night pictures here I actually was um, able to go eat at a uh, really big city one time beautiful um, nighttime view the restaurant we had at had a had a, um, a porch that overlooked everything and uh, the, the the street and everything and I actually did not have a tripod I actually just set it on a table okay leaned it did the 10 second thing pressed it and I got some really good uh, nightscape pictures and we'll talk about that in just a second also our cell phones have little things that you can get clamped on I eventually see Apple coming out with their own camera I don't think that would be that difficult. There's actually some um, in South Korea and some other um, Asian countries, they're actually coming out with Android phones that do have a cell phone. I mean, excuse me, a camera connected to it. Um, so I think that's kind of going towards it more of a trend. Um, so we'll see about that. So you get the plus of the software uploading stuff to social media and you could actually do stuff like this as well. Okay. So here's a couple right here. Let's say that they brought a tripod with them or maybe even something small like this. So maybe there's like a, um, a bench there or something possibly. They want to get a really good picture of this. In the minute, we'll talk about doing our shutter speed and everything. And they took the picture and then they, they got or in the picture and the background's all lit up as well. Okay. So a big solution to blur is to use a tripod, have the camera set on something try to be very stable. So if I don't have a tripod, what are there other things that I can do? Well, let's talk about making yourself a tripod, okay? And this goes for cell phone pictures as well. No, don't do it one-handed with your arms all the way out like that. That makes the picture, the camera very unsteady. Uh, this is one that you see a lot with folks. Don't do that as well. Just your, you think it's very uh, steady, but it's really not things to do pull your arms in and try to be very very stiff you know pulling your arms in just like she has here and then you'll actually make yourself into your own tripod or at least the best you can okay one thing it'll talk about is leaning up against something so let's say there's a wall here just the act of you leaning against the wall makes you more stable okay or do something like this put the camera on something you know and she's just kind of has it set there while she's uh, you know taking the picture or whatever and there you go right there try to take a breath or blow out a breath it doesn't matter which one um, before you take a picture and it's more, less likely to be blurry okay now a lot of this our cameras now have stuff like uh, blur reduction steady cam all kinds of stuff like that but still these are really good tips especially if you're not getting the pictures that you want. It's like, oh, I'm not getting the picture I want. Or this camera isn't smart enough. Why, why isn't it doing, doing certain things? Like, well, is there things that you could do to help? 
All right. And if y'all have any questions at any time, of course, you know, just let me know as well. All right. So let's talk about different kinds of lighting. Okay. Uh, with my light kit here, the interesting thing is that I'm actually using uh, what they call as daylight. Uh, most of our houses, we actually use kind of a golden um, tone to it. Sunlight, um, unless it's actually, you know, a different color because of um, the atmosphere or whatever, or clouds or whatever, it really is just kind of white. It's a white light that comes out unless it's kind of a golden in the morning or something like this. So inside, we actually will have to deal with different lighting types. Sunlight, moonlight, if that's possible. Will I ever need to use a flash during the day? Absolutely, you might have to use a flash during the day. If the sunlight is behind somebody, you may have to use a flash, okay? Maybe if it's too harsh on, on their, your, your subject. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you need to turn so the light's not behind them, but, you know, to, in front of them. Now, traveling, you will get in the, into the thing, let's say, we're going to go, we're going to go to the Grand Canyon, and we're looking at the Grand Canyon, and it's really, uh, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun's really bright, and everybody's kind of out there squinting. Is there any really a thing that you can really do about that? Probably not. Maybe turn a little more, don't have the sun directly behind their head. Maybe kind of find a little bit of shade for them to be in, but you still may have to use a flash if it's too bright or they're, excuse me, if they're too much in the shade, okay? So that's very possible too. They're actually talking about looking at UV light, which if it's not making the, the color of your subject what you want, you know, there's a uh, fluorescent light and sometimes you can actually turn your camera into until it let, let it know that it is fluorescent light you're using or indoor light in some way and it'll try to compensate for that. There is a golden hour or two hours. They talk about 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then usually here in class, someone goes, well, what about daylight savings time? I'm like, I don't know about daylight savings time. It's about, it's about that time frame, okay? So in uh, the hours, you know, 10 o'clock, you know, to about 4 p.m. or before sunset, an hour before sun, um, excuse me, before sunrise, an hour before sunset, kind of the golden hours in there. Um, a lot of folks will talk about, uh, I guess they'd say like an Easter Sunday picture. Uh, someone goes out there and they're like, oh, we took the best pictures on Easter Sunday. Like, well, it was about 10 a.m., wasn't it? 9.30, 9 o'clock, 10 a.m. It's like, yeah, that was a good time to go out and take a picture because the sun looked really good. So you'll see professional photographers. We'll just see what time it is and then they'll go outside and, and you know, take pictures, even if they have expensive uh, sets and all kinds of stuff, you know, just because of the lighting being so good. All right, so... Lighting, kind of playing around with that. Soft light, if you're taking pictures indoors, you want some like a white light, okay? All right, let's talk about our exposure, okay? So what exactly does that mean? Overexposure, underexposure. So let's say we have our church here. Is the light allowed to the image sensor? So we actually have a church that has windows, okay? And I'm trying to get it so I can see inside this church or cathedral or temple or whatever it is. I'm not sure. And it actually has um, lights here coming in from the windows. So if I take it at one exposure, you can't see the windows. It's overexposed. And this is kind of underexposed. Okay. So you pretty much have bad photo overexposure or under, underexposure. Okay. Over, it's too bright. Under, it's too dark. And in the middle is uh, what we can control. In a second, I'll show you how you can actually control that with the cell phone too, okay? So we're gonna go into all this. So we're talking about bad photos, how can we fix them, and then we'll talk about our manual settings, how you can fix them even more, okay? All right, so too much light over, too little light, okay? Over bright image with white spots, under bright image with black spots, okay? Getting the best exposure can be difficult in scenes with contrasting light. So let's talk about our cell phone. How can we fix this with our cell phone? Again, like I said, the software in our cell phone is a big help to us. It may not have that really big long zoom on it. Uh, some of the newer cameras may have a little bit of zoom on there, make it a little bit wider, wider um, lens that you can switch to as well. 
Uh, so it kind of gives you some more options. But of course, the big thing is we can actually tap on our subject. So we have our subject here, our family, overexposure, too much here, and this looks just right here. How do we do that? Well, with our Apple devices, I don't have it for um, the Android. Uh, Apple's what I have, so this is more what I'm familiar with. I can actually tap on it. It'll actually try to do an autofocus, or if I tap and hold, and then it actually will come up with this, and I can actually do a, a, a bar, drag it up and down, okay? And that'll actually allow me to change the, the autofocus too. So then turn, I can actually change the exposure uh, on there with the, the auto exposure and change that. So the focus does pretty good. You know, mostly we're doing pictures of people or, or things or food or lunch or whatever. Um, but that allows you to do that. Um, if you do want to, you know, take something, picture of something small, maybe food or something, just remember you tap on what you want. Usually our, our camera phones now will actually kind of try to auto-focus on what you told it to focus on, and then you might get that where the background's out of, uh, is a little bit blurry too, which, which we're going to talk about um, focal point in just a minute here. Another thing that our cell phones have in their software is something called HDR or high dynamic range. Okay, the high dynamic range, a big thing with that is mergers, it will merge three pictures into one at different exposures. Okay, you may or may not really notice that your camera does this, uh, but you can go to the settings, make sure it's on. And depending on what you're doing, you may, may make it look a little bit more surreal. So here's our underexposure, overexposure, regular exposure. It's put them together so it has a little bit more of a highlights right on the edges of the picture with the overexposure and maybe with the background. So it's actually made the, the upper background here a little bit lighter than in our original one here. Do you see how this is less golden? This is a little bit too golden, so this is kind of medium in there, and it's kind of merged it with the lower one. So that's a, a, a I'd say, more expert um, way of doing our pictures is merging them together. So if you were using a normal camera, you'd have to go into the settings and change the exposure, rechange the exposure, change it again, take all those pictures, have some software that would merge them together. But a lot of times with our smartphones, it's already there and it allows us a little bit more flexibility, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and let's talk about aperture and shutter speed, okay? These are complex uh, concepts, okay? So I've tried to break that, them down to the easiest way I can explain them, and I have some nice visuals I hope you'll enjoy. And also the good part about it is if you are using a uh, camera in manual mode or if you're using a smartphone and download like a uh, manual mode like a camera plus software or whatever you can still or that night vision one I talked about you can still play around with these settings and the cameras will do everything else so you can just play around with the aperture and it'll do the exposure and the shutter speed automatically and I'll talk about that in just a second too so don't worry if this is too too detailed you can actually play around with this this one setting and have the camera or the cell phone do the rest of the work okay all right so let's talk about our aperture okay aperture is the size of the opening in the lens that allows light through the lens similar to an eyes pupil okay so if it's really bright outside that means our pupil gets smaller and if it's really dark outside to see more things, our pupil gets larger, okay? Let's more light in. Now with our camera, that actually creates a, a focal point that we're trying to focus on, okay? So you'll hear terms of f-stop. Just re remember f-stop, aperture, focal point are all the same thing, okay? One of the things I think this makes this confusing and because even our smartphones still use these terms, just like they did with, um, you know, a, a digital SR, a, a SLR camera, it actually will come in and start talking about f-stop. You're like, well, what is that? Well, that's the aperture on there. Okay, so they kind of reflect 
what the old terms used to be, so do realize that, so don't get too confused on that. That's our depth of field, okay? If it's higher, that means it absorbs or takes in more um, of the items in focus. If it's smaller, it means the depth of field is shorter, okay? So this is kind of the classic thing of someone says, well, I'm trying to take a picture of this and I want the background to be blurry. Oh no, I don't know what to do. Well, you have to learn how to use the depth of field or you might be able to just have it at the right angle, tap on that, and then the depth of field will have changed, okay? So let's talk about it a little bit here. So we actually come in to play, here's our depth of field being very small. So we have our whole number and then we go down and we're talking about um, you know, less, 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 point, whatever, two point. So the aperture de determines depth of field. The smaller the number, less in focus, the larger the opening, uh, shallow depth of field. The larger the number, more in focus, smaller the opening, uh, depth, uh, deep depth of field, okay? So we have it very small number or short. Then even if there's something close to us, it'll be out of focus but the background's out of focus as well, and the only something that's um, you know close to us will be in focus. So we actually, come on, we move it more, more, this is more in focus, this is more in focus, more. Both these things now are in focus, but the background still is out of focus. A little more, a little more, all the way. So this is kind of like what point and shoot cameras try to do their best. So everything is in focus is what they really try to do, and our cell phones try to do this too. It wants everything in focus because they think that's what you want, okay? So if it's smaller, the number is less, okay? Uh, excuse me, if it's smaller, it means it lets in more, okay? And if it's more open, there's your blur right there because it lets in less because our number is less, okay? All right, so let's talk about our shutter speed and why it's important. Shutter speed appears as whole numbers, but are really fractions, okay? So we talked about something that basically will deal with decimals, which is our f-stop or aperture. And now we're going to talk about shutter speed, which will start talking about fractions of a second, okay? Shutter speed appears as whole numbers, but are really fractions. One si um, so if you see 60, it'll be 60 of a second. Uh, one one hundred and twenty-fifth of a second, which means less and less and less and less of a second. Therefore, that's what we know, one sixtieth and one hundred and twenty-fifth. One one hundred twenty-fifth is actually less of a second, okay? Now, one of the things is the shutter speed can actually control the brightness of something or its exposure, okay? So do realize that, and that's a big one of why we want to use our different automatic modes and not just put it on M, which is our manual mode, okay? Even on uh, like an iPhone, the Camera Plus has a fully manual mode. Still don't recommend that. Still plan on using the, um, the other settings because then your pictures might be too bright or dark or something like that, okay? It can happen. Let it that do that automatically. And we'll, I'll tell you how. So what is shutter speed? It's less time letting it take a picture, okay? So it tries to freeze time. So have you ever been to a sporting event and this is basically what you get? This is kind of what you get, the person running, it's a lot of blur, even though it's during the day. Well, if you made it slower, less opening for our shutter, then it can freeze things in time. Slow shutter speed is the length of time the camera's lens a shutter is open. In other words, how long the camera spends taking the picture, okay? So here's some examples. So the one on the top left, basically the water looks like it's frozen in the air. That's one one thousandth of a second. Here's one one hundred twenty-fifth of a second. Here's one and twenty-seven, excuse me, fifth of a second. And there's here's one 15th of a second. So do you see the water looks blurry? Okay, but here is so so slight that it's open that it actually looks like the water uh, Droplets are kind of frozen in the air. 
Here's another example. One second, looks like it's all blurry. One sixtieth, there you go. And then one one thousandth of a second, it looks like the little grains of sugar are frozen in the air, okay? Now, these are fractions of one second. Let's push it the opposite way, and let's talk about having the shutter open for four seconds. So imagine this being completely dark, and you give a child, this is a fun thing to do. Anyone can do this. I've done this with the cell phone and stuff. Um, I was using the night vision software because it did allow me to change uh, the shutter speed. And I think I told it like four or six or something, and then like had uh, family had sparklers, and they tried to write their name and stuff, and I'd go, go! And they'd try to write their name, and it worked out pretty well, actually. So here you are right here. You set it to that. You try to stay still as you possibly can, and then tell them to go, and then don't say it's going to last four seconds, so keep going. And then there you go. You get something kind of neat like this with a sparkler. And this is how you get your road stuff. So you don't absolutely, absolutely have to have a tripod, but it is a good idea, or at least to be sitting down or something. Now this one, you definitely need to have a tripod because any kind of basic movement, it'll make everything blurry. Um, so setting it up for, and a lot of cameras may not be able to do this, setting it up to have it open for 30 seconds to take the picture, okay? So this makes it look like the cars are kind of streaming down the road. And there you go right there. And a lot of people work hard to try to get that picture. And like I said, I did it on a trip and I was on a, um, a balcony. I set up the camera, set it to uh, take the picture in 10 seconds. And I think I set it to try to stay open like six seconds or so, hit the shutter, waited, and then it took the picture and it basically looked kind of like this, okay? All right, so let's talk about our composition of pictures. So we've kind of talked about our ways of doing things. And well, let me show, let me show you this, this next part here. So when we actually uh, look at our camera, and this could be in our manual mode if we're using some software for our, our um, cell phones and stuff, you may see something on there that says program. You may see something that says A or AV. That's our aperture, S or TV. Or M, which means manual. Okay, so let's read here. In this mode, you set the aperture, and the camera automatically calculates the appropriate shutter speed for a given exposure value. So it means that it'll, it'll, if I have it in this mode, the A or AV, it actually will figure out what it thinks the shutter speed should do, and also the exposure and the ISO. So it's doing everything else automatically. Okay. So this is a great mode to play around with this, um, you know. And then also we have our S or TV. I have no idea why it's called TV, but some cameras call it that. Mine does for some reason. S or TV stands for shutter. So again, you put it in this mode, you can play around with the shutter and the settings and aperture and ISO are all automatically uh, set by the sensors on the camera. Okay, so it should put you in good shape for being able to play around with everything. All right, so composition. So composition is a selection and arrangement of object, objects in the picture area. A well-composed um, photograph, a well-composed photograph is more attractive and pleasing to the viewer. There are six guidelines to follow to get well-composed uh, photos. So we've talked about uh, our, using our camera, megapixels, um, SD cards, all kinds of stuff. And then we just talked to cover it a lot and now we're going to talk about composition. Okay. So have you ever watched a movie, TV show, and it looks like they're all lined up perfectly? And your brain kind of goes, why, why does that look so great? Why does that composition look so great? It's because it's using the rule of thirds. Okay or the golden ratio is what you may hear as well. So can you do this too? Well, I'll tell you that in a second. How about this picture right here? So lined up from a James Bond film. We've got these, this kind of set up. They're perfectly lined up here. Their heads are kind of lined up. What exactly is that? Ah, it's the rule of thirds. What about this shot right here? Someone in the desert walking around in a famous movie, okay? Again, rule of thirds. 
What about this one here? Ooh, we have our leading lines, don't we? Okay, person walking in a classroom and the, the um, you know, the cinematographer got it just perfect. Oh, there's our leading lines right there. Okay. Let's talk about composition. Uh, simplicity, fill the frame. Rule of thirds. Lines. Balance. And framing. Mergers. Let's start off with simplicity. Focus on one subject. Have a simple background. Place the subject slightly off center. So if we have our subject here, would this picture look better if it was closer? Focus on the subject. Keep the details in there. Uh, start far and move closer. Okay. Fill the frame. Uh, that fits. Okay. Oh, let's see. So, hey, Mac, how are you? Glad you're here today. Let's see. Do you have any suggestions on the, uh, I guess it's the iPhone Pro Max with three lenses? Well, my biggest suggestion on that one is, is to definitely get to know your camera. There are some um, websites that are talking about the different lenses. So it does have kind of your basic lens. It also does have your, uh, it's about a two zoom. Okay, it's kind of like stepping a few step forward, but also it has a wide lens as well. And that's basically so you can get yourself and some other folks in the pictures too. And one of the things about that is, is that getting more pictures with, the, I guess, more people in them, that can be very helpful too. But mostly just play around with the camera is what I really recommend. Just go in the backyard and just kind of test it out is what I kind of like to say. But it does have some really nice features on it and you can switch back and forth with the different settings and of course with the zoom and everything as well. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. Let's see. Let's see one second. And a big thing too is to kind of think about to tap on your subject as well. All right, so get closer to your subject. It's a big one right there. Try to zoom in if you do have a zoom. Try to set it so maybe something interesting is the background. So let's kind of look at these two pictures here. So this could be accomplished with zoom, moving closer. You know, if you're trying to do kind of a wide angle of picture, try, if you have that option on your camera, uh, try to use that. So here's kind of our bird, and we're kind of walking closer, zooming in on them. Here's our girl right here. So the background's kind of looking a little bit, you know, more focused on that, so we get closer to the girl. This one here is showing cars in the parking lot. So let's try to crop it or get closer to, let's say it's like a mission or something there. Fill the frame, simplicity, compare the single frame. So there's a whole bunch going on this picture, trying to make it a little bit more simple. With busy photo on the left. Now single dominant or angle on a subject. So kind of imagine there's a whole playground of kids playing and instead of getting on his eye level and taking a picture there, trying to take a picture of actually what he's drawing, okay? Uh, here's a picture that I took of some flowers. All I did, this is a iPhone 7, uh, got close to the pictures, just tapped on it, 
and it automatically focused on uh, just the pit, just the flowers, and made the background blurry. So the newer phones will do that too. Um, so just kind of think about what your subject is, tap to get it to focus on that subject, and or like I talked about, kind of press and hold, and then you can change the exposure level as well. Now another thing is to try to be simplistic with something. Let's talk about changing our angle. Okay, so this is a picture. I was at a restaurant uh, near Savannah. So what I did was I actually changed my viewpoint because it because I thought the sign was really neat and I had this really 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 beautiful background and stuff but I thought well how can I make this big better well all I did was I actually just stepped to the left a little bit and then boom I put the please do not feed the birds in the top left and then basically just kind of allowed the the boardwalk to create itself so instead of just having this picture step into the left a little bit putting the the crab in the top left and then having it kind of go along we'll talk about our leading lines in just a little bit uh, going that way and I think it was a much better picture and then you get to see the shrimp boat and stuff so this is a big one here how can we actually see these things all the time well you could actually turn on the grid lines on your camera or your smartphone okay I recommend you doing this and so one of the big things from this class takeaway is to definitely turn that on and one of the things that you'll get with that as well is that you'll kind of always think about that so you'll have the leading line not lead but you'll have the uh, the uh, rule of thirds with you kind of all the time it's like a tic-tac-toe board place the subject at the intersection place uh, hori um, uh, horizons high or low in the picture rarely should horizons be in the middle okay kind of like this try, I'm trying to line it up with a tree all of a sudden here's the horizon all of a sudden will your pictures get better yes they will immediately get better if you just start using this all the time now could you have this on and just take normal pictures sure you could but kind of think about what you're going to take a picture of. Try to kind of set things up. Put stuff not just in the middle, but off to the side, left or, or, or right there. There's your negative spacing. I won't go into that too much, but it just kind of goes into details about that. Let's talk about our rule of thirds. Okay. So this is kind of a natural setting up. It could be a frame, as someone might say. Our natural rule of thirds here's one example can you see it on there there's our line there's kind of a line here and then we have our subject in one of those don't we yep there we go right there Ooh, this is a pretty shot don't you like that picture ah hey dr. Emmy How are you? You see, I try to remember not to have so in the background they can change my picture. For example, someone might look like they have a halo and actually is light behind them above their head. Ah, that's a good one too. Uh, so again, maybe step to the left or to the right before you take a picture. Um, I, another thing is you may actually want to have some kind of like little glass uh, cleaner wipes uh, for like glasses but you could put those in your like um, you know pro pocket purse or something because sometimes we may need to clean our cameras 
Um, if it's a, a cell phone, you know, maybe we've had it in, uh, someone's had it in their pocket or a purse or something, and the lenses have gotten dirty. So that could actually create kind of a halo effect as well. And if you're going into a place that's cold and you're in a warm place or vice versa, you're outside in the cold and you come in and maybe your device got cold, you may want to give it a little bit of time because it can happen with the camera where it does get kind of foggy on the inside. So you have to let it kind of um, uh, get ready to get ready to what's going on with the environment too. But yeah, moving left to right, one little step. The reason I mention that is because I think it's not really that big a deal uh, to do that. And, uh, you know, from your subject, you could just tell your subject to move, but you're, you moving a little bit left to right could be very helpful. All right, so let's talk about our rule of thirds here. We're going to talk about mergers in just a second, too. So hopefully that was helpful. So here's kind of our example, the rule of thirds, so simply... Uh, it's so simple that many photographers want to look for something more complicated, okay? So aligning your subject, here's a girl on the train tracks. We'll talk about li leading lines in just a second. So we have leading lines going on. We also have the girl here. She's all lined up here. We have our horizon on our line as well. The girl here is lined up perfectly right there with our, our um, the right line there. Here's a little girl looking in the window. She's got her lined up here. Uh, the rest, are, you know, this is just her eyesight, I guess. So you just have it this lined up. So it's kind of her eyesight and she's looking in. I Maybe it's a bakery or a candy store or something. Here's a little girl walking off into the distance uh, with like a little dog or something. There, It lines up with the hor horizontal uh, sunset there. This here looks like somebody's kind of gotten a bottle. Maybe they're on a cruise somewhere. Put it on their, um, you know, the, the cabin. Anybody could do this. Uh, put it on their cabin balcony. Kind of line up the horizon here. And then boom, you got a really great picture. And this majestic dog right here, majestic. Got him lined up. His eyesight's kind of going off that way. Having him on the left because it's kind of leaving this space here. So you're looking to see what he's seeing too. All right, so let's talk about a sense of movement, okay? So if I take a picture, and like this one here, it looks like the person moved already, so it's kind of like less interesting. You set up a picture where someone is moving into the picture, that could be helpful too. All right, Dr. Amy says, we missed your classes over the holiday break, so glad to see you're back as usual. I'm learning a lot of information in today's class. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you for being in class. And there is a way that I can. And I'm very glad to be back too. And thank you for being here. So smiley face. <laughs> There you go. Oh, I hit sent. Sorry. Yay, so smiley face. Thank you for saying that. All right, so we have our bird kind of flying here. Don't have the bird in the middle. Try to put the bird kind of in a section here. Like this one, it looks like action's going on. She's going this way across the screen. We also are seeing the action going on here with the waves. Okay. Giving move, um, give moving, ugh. give moving subjects room to move in the picture. Now let's talk about one of the big ones here is the golden ratio. And I actually have an end video for um, everyone to watch, which would be very helpful. So the golden ratio here, we're kind of looking at these steps. It's a little, little close to our rule of thirds. You see it kind of lines up a little bit, but there's a little bit of a different off kilter. And also you may or may not notice this and you may be taking pictures like this. Um, you may not even realize that it is doing something special. So we have our uh, folks here sitting on the bench. We have this really big, uh, you know, staircase going on. The building is its own person or character. This is coming in here with our golden ratio where we have this big space here, this castle, the waterway and everything, and then the big castle, um, you know, t steeples or whatever that are there. Golden ratio can see very seem very complex at first. 
It's quite simple. Slightly more complex version of the rule of thirds. Instead of a regular grid, the frame is divided into a series of squares. So let's talk about which photo is more interesting. Okay. So we have one here. It's kind of looking at this plastic. We see the house. Okay. We have one here where it's kind of a cut through here, kind of like a path going up near the house. And then we have one that's kind of cut through our view. So which one do you think is more interesting? Ah, the middle one. I would say the middle one you see a beginning and end and you also see the house in the background as well kind of like a leading line oh is that what we're going to talk about next use dynamic lines to make the pictures interesting use leading lines to draw attention to the subject so we have our lines okay so it kind of goes along this way kind of cuts through here let's see yep now, are they perfect? No, they're not perfect. They're just kind of leading, okay? Kind of getting your eye to look at it in a certain way, okay? Uh, are they always of uh, squares? No. They can be like an S, kind of curvy going back and forth too. Oh, here's the one right there going off into the distance. See, like an S curve. Uh, here's a big one, just standing in front of a, a, a long fence and kind of taking a picture. Get to see that. This one I like a lot. You can kind of just kind of have it see the lines appear. And it's just stepping to the left or right sometimes. And here's a photographer taking a picture of a bride. And then boom, because of where they were standing, the leading lines just kind of showed up. Here's the easy one. Train tracks going somewhere, leading off into the distance. Here's other lines, Oop, a rainbow coming from Mount Olympus or Pantheon, I think that is actually. Here's leading lines kind of going this way, curving. We get to see kind of a, uh, a field here and people are headed that way. So it gives us kind of action, people moving, riding their bikes. Here's some leading lines going this way, kind of fanning out. This is a really neat one too. So we see a long fence and then we have a subject over here. It looks like that subject's going fishing. Okay. So if we look at our leading lines, it kind of goes out, kind of culminates and makes you want to look in this direction. And when you do, there is a payoff. You get to see a person up. Oh, what are they doing? They have a whole story about them. They've walked this whole path. Okay. What about balance? Okay. To prevent having a picture that looks lopsided, Provide objects and shapes on either side of the picture. It provides visual support to objects that need it. Okay, so this one here, you see one wheel, but you don't see the other one. Make sure the other wheel's in there so it doesn't look like she's about to fall over. And if we look at it now, she, she's actually, this is kind of more of the, uh, the setup here with our lines, but now she's more in the area of our rule of thirds. The wheel on the right is not in the picture and the wheel lacks support. Excuse me. Yeah, the wheel has a uh, visual support on both sides of the picture so now it looks a lot more balanced. All right, let's talk about uh, elements in the scene. Include a secondary object of lesser importance or size on the other side of the frame. This balance is out the composition without taking too much focus off the main subject of the photographer or uh, photograph, excuse me. Eiffel Tower in the distance kind of counterbalances. Okay. We do have our rule of thirds lines that kind of line that up. Okay. There we go. Rule of thirds kind of does that, but then that's a little bit smaller. The church tower in the distance provides balance on the other side of the frame. Uh, what about these? 
what's kind of going on interesting in these photos. Ah, so it looks kind of like there's kind of uh, something here, not blocking our view, but kind of framing our view, doesn't it? This frames our view here. This one, not so much. So let's talk about framing. Use foreground objects to highlight the subject and give the picture depth. Pictures of scenery should have a foreground and a background to provide some visual depth to the picture. So we have our framing, okay? Here's two people here. There's our framing going on, almost rule of thirds. They're kind of more in the middle though. There's your framing. This is kind of an arrow upside down framing, I guess you'd say. Sideways square maybe. And look, this one's a person that's gone to sleep in class. And look, someone used their purse to do framing with the person that's asleep. That's kind of funny, isn't it? So framing can be pretty much anything. Now let's talk about something else. Taking a picture of somebody, and oh no, it looks like something's growing out of their head. Oh no, what's happening? Uh, it's mergers, and they're bad. Mergers are something to avoid, a background object that interferes with the subject. An object that is too close to the subject that takes attention away from the subject. A border merger is where people's heads or feet are cut off at the edge of the photo. Look at this girl here. She's got balloons coming out of her head, doesn't she? Okay. So someone moved her, put like a bush with some pretty flowers behind it. There you go. That's much better. So just try to kind of, as we wrap this part up, remember these are guidelines, not rules. Try them and see if your photos improve. And I have a little video I'm going to show. All right, so this is a photographer, and he actually has a nice little video here where he kind of explains basically the rules that we discussed and then he kind of does examples from his international photos that he's taken okay so he's going to talk about the rule of thirds
remember that composition is important, but also rules are meant to be broken. So the main point is to uh, enjoy yourself while you're photographing and uh, photograph in your own way, in your own style. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a wonderful video. So he shows examples of pictures he's taken internationally. And then he comes in and talks about basically how those rules can be broken and you can basically take pictures any way you want but you know it's a good start for those uh, pictures right there I guess alright so we've come to the kind of our end of our class here and definitely we still recommend turning on the rule of thirds on your camera on your cell phone and you will take better pictures I promise think about framing all kinds of stuff and what we used to do is we'd actually have the classes so it was like one week we would do this class and the next time we would be doing um, the the next step into it backing up our pictures and stuff but we'll actually be doing it um, you know tomorrow oh thank you Dr. Emil I, I'm glad that you enjoyed the video I think it's a wonderful video too um, so good I'm glad you enjoyed that so let's talk about what we're going to be doing tomorrow well come join me at 11 a.m. And I'm actually going to be doing, and let me disappear because I am blocking the thing there. 11 a.m., come join me. We're going to be doing talking about cord cutting with our antennas. We've actually broken up the cord cutting class into two parts now so that we can have more discussion about antennas and more discussion about our different streaming services. Uh, it's the thing that those topics kind of got so big, and it's like, well, I don't want to rush anything. I do want to add more content to it. Um, so let's just break those up into two classes. So come join me tomorrow morning for uh, cutting the cord antenna. And then on the 20th, that'll be part one on the Harlem Facebook page. And then on the 20th, we'll be doing part two, uh, cord cutting streaming services, free and paid apps and devices on the Harlem Facebook page as well. So that's like part one and part two. Now. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be doing the Photography Fundamentals and Cloud Backup again here on YouTube, so come join me for that. And then on Thursday, on the Grovetown Facebook page, I'm going to be doing the Google Suite 101, learning how to use Google um, and all those services there that they have on the... Oops. Drop something there. On the Google Suite service. Um, the the writing the basically the online word the online Excel the online PowerPoint so that's what we'll be talking about okay but they're the Google services and also Google Drive as well and then on Thursday afternoon we'll be doing our advanced photo editing and layers class so come join me with that we'll be using GIMP um, if you've wanted to do some basic editing removing a blemish from a photo that's definitely the class for you and I've also expanded that class so now it includes editing with different layers and stuff and uh, come join me for that that's a lot of fun and it's a lot of a um, lot more advanced editing than what we'll talk about uh, tomorrow and then next week we'll be talking about let's talk about Libby and our free ebook so now's the time if you did get a new device maybe a new phone new tablet or something uh, Amazon Fire now's the time to go ahead and we'll talk about downloading Libby and also our other free library resources that we have free from the library to magazines um, ebooks all kinds of stuff uh, the video services Acorn TV uh, really amazing and awesome opportunities that we have and then on the 20th at 2.30 come join me that'll be the uh, third class of our week no, no the end of the second week classes sorry we'll be doing our cord cutting at 2.30 and then on the 21st, we'll be doing our cord cutting streaming services at 2.30. And our big thing that we're doing is we will be doing a gadget help on each Facebook page this month. So um, figured the first of the month, people want to know a lot of things about maybe setting up their cell phones, maybe uh, getting their new device set up or any questions that they have about emails and everything. So come join me for that. If I don't get a ton of questions, then I'll talk about a lot of the free services that are free from the library. Or kind of what everybody kind of asks questions about. So there we go. There's a little snowman blowing around there. And he says, Happy New Year. And then our big thing is the end of the month, we're actually going to be doing our Instant Pot 
uh, demonstration and then our new air fryer demonstration. So come join me for those two classes on the 28th at 11 o'clock on the Grovetown Facebook and on the 28th at uh, 2.30 on the uh, Columbia County Library Facebook page. So come join me for those classes too. And we're doing a chess class too. Yay! So libraries are open with limited services and hours. Curbside Holds Pickup is available. You can go to gchrl.org for details or you can call in with the library with questions Monday through Friday 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You're on the YouTube channel right now. Just log in, hit subscribe and stuff. And also if you're trying to find our YouTube channel, all you need to do is just search the YouTube app for GCHRL videos and it'll pop right up too. All right, so we've come to the end of our class. Thank you so much for being here and everything. <laughs> I'm, you've had asked some great questions and it's so wonderful for you guys to be here with me today. And I look forward to seeing you in some future classes too. So bye-bye for now, stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>